plus children who are growing and uh, at least one is heading towards puberty. That's the classic perfect storm, isn't it, for, for a poltergeist outbreak? Sure. That's, that's before we add in um, the brother that decides he's going to experiment with the occult. Huh. Wow. I was thinking um, it's, there wasn't a lot, especially even in the news. The only one I can think of would have been the Enfield poltergeist case. Yeah, Enfield, huh. and, and also I encourage people, well, I'm biased, of course, but Enfield was one of my favorite cases. I read Guy Lyon Playfair's book growing up, This House is Haunted. If you haven't read it, I recommend everybody read that book. It's one of the best documents of a haunting I've ever seen. Enfield's a controversial case. There are many that that insist the whole thing was a fraud, a hoax. Um, I personally don't believe that because the investigators that, that, that work so hard on it, I, I trust their integrity and they, they have a good reputation and did some very solid um, foundation science. But the Black Monk of Pontefract case, I'm very attached to that because I lived in that house for six days and nights and wrote a book about it called, um, you might be surprised, The Black Monk of Pontefract. Mm -hmm. um, that is also a very similar case which occurred in the late 60s. What was unique about it, though, was that most poltergeist cases burn out very quickly. And I always refer to the poltergeist phenomenon as the shooting star of the paranormal world. You know, it burns right. very brightly, very fiercely, but it's gone relatively quickly. Right. Uh, whereas the, the Black Monk House in Pontefract is active 60 years after the initial poltergeist outbreak took place. Wow. 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 Yeah, that is not normal. No. Wow. Well, it's it's definitely atypical, and of course, it, it tells you yeah. there's something more than a poltergeist case going on. Sure. I I remember reading um, from the late um, Colin Wilson, um, mm. his book called The Occult, uh, and he was questioning what poltergeist activity was, and I cannot remember the other person's name basically said it's like an energy ball and they're playing kick the ball with this energy and they're just kicking it back and forth. Yeah, the, the psychic football I mean, theory. And Colin yeah. actually wrote the book Poltergeist, um, a study yes. of destructive hauntings, yeah. and that was built around the Black Monk House. Colin was the first investigator to in, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s to document the Black Monk haunting. He did all of the initial research um, and, and documentation into that case. So I very much um, owe him a great debt of gratitude. Um, he, he did a good job. I think I disagree with a couple of his conclusions, but he interviewed the family directly at the time uh, and spent a lot of time bringing that story to light. It was national and international news back in the late 60s. People were camping out outside that house at night. It was crazy because it had such a fearsome reputation. Um, and Colin did a great job of, of, of recording it for posterity. <laughs> and oddly enough, he also had a fascination with serial killers. <laughs> he did, didn't he? Colin Wilson yep. was one of my favorite writers. Um, remains. I would love to have met him, and I'm really sad that I'll never get to. Not this side of the veil, anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never can he tell. He wrote this <laughs> absolutely fascinating book called The Mind Parasites, which still inspires me today about telekinesis. Uh, and the human mind being able to to perform a lot more than we think we can do. Um, mm -hmm. and, and poltergeist might be part of that as well. Um, how much of this, uh, the hauntings, do you come across that you think actually might be human, uh, living human projections as opposed to actual spiritual activity? Well, that's, that's a great point because when you look at the original SPR, the, the Society for Psychical Research, studies that they did, um, a hundred and I would say 120 years ago or thereabouts, phantasms of the living was a well documented study, and they found that many people see the the apparitions of those who are not dead, who are perfectly well, alive and well. We we I think have a bias now where we tend to think ghost equals dead person, don't we? You know, um, I've always thought that sure. words like ghost and haunting are very similar to words like cancer, and I hate to to make that um, correlation. But what I mean is that cancer is an umbrella term for a family of diseases. You know, cancer is not one thing. It's, it's really a, an umbrella description. 
And so you're describing kind of a spectrum of pathologies. And when you say haunting, on the one end of that spectrum, you have something like the residual recordings, you know, the, I, w I was fortunate enough to record the sound of cannon fire at Gettysburg um, at Pickett's Charge, Henry, for example. Yes. When I, you know, um, that's 100% residual. I don't truly believe that there were the spirits of artillerymen still firing um, all these years later. I think it's a type of natural recording. Right. But at the other end of that spectrum of a haunting, you have these intelligent communications which will ask and answer questions and sometimes interact with you on request yes I've you had know? That. So, mm -hmm. and, and i think that phantoms or phantasms of the living uh, fit into that spectrum somewhere in the middle and there are many well-documented cases of of people seeing somebody who was still alive at the time who was not aware of them they almost acted like they were a, a hologram right you know mm -hmm. um and, and the other the other type of apparition you don't hear of much anymore but was extremely well documented is the crisis apparition. Um, a lot of this came out of the First World War when um, you would have mothers at home uh, whose sons were dying on the battlefield and they either saw their son and thought that he had physically come home or they heard his voice and heard him calling out to them as the young man was hundreds of miles away, you know, breathing his last. Right. So the crisis apparition is also very well documented. Historically speaking. Oh, and Kat points out very much in the chat room, too. Uh, yeah, there is astral projection and there is bilocation. I mean, uh, the Stargate program in the United States pretty much proved that you could uh, remote view in, and it's possible that some people are seeing remote viewers, maybe. Uh, I certainly wouldn't discount that. And another one is the whole um, uh, interdimensional theory. I had a strange experience, or I should say my colleague Sean Crusher had a strange experience once. We were at the Outlaws and Lawmans Museum in Cripple Creek, Colorado, which is an old jail. Um, and I was in one of the cells with another investigator standing in the doorway, so I could not possibly have gotten out. And Sean saw me at the same time standing outside on the cell block. And when he came into the mm -hmm. cell and saw me there, he was quite shaken because he knew I could not physically have gotten past him and into the cell. Hmm. But he swore he knows what I look like. He didn't make a mistake. It wasn't a trick of the light. He saw me. He said, you were dressed identically, except your shirt was different. Now, anyone that knows me knows that um, I, 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 my uniform in daily life, because I have no dress sense at all, <laughs> is pretty much the same type of um, BDU 511 tactical pants that a lot of people in my profession wear. Um, I, I own like 10 pairs of those. So I'm always wearing those, some kind of boots, and then whatever T-shirt I managed to throw on. And Sean had said, your shirt was different, but that was it. It was definitely you. You were taking photographs of the cell block. And he never gave it a second thought. You know, he truly just believed I was standing out there. And, and so some have called that a doppelganger experience. Right. But then... Dave Schrader, if, if you're familiar with Dave, um, raised a great point. He said, what if at some point in the future you go back to that jail and you happen to be wearing what Sean saw you wearing? Could this be a time slip? Could this be you from a nearby uh, pocket universe, which, you know, it interacted, it kind of merged with ours for a moment. And so in some parallel universe, there's another Richard Estep who's also investigating this night, but he's dressed slightly differently and he's not in a cell. And that's what Sean caught sight of, you know? Um, it really, 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 <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm reading Nathaniel's comment in the chat room. Tell your girlfriend not to give you crap, Nathaniel, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I have no dress sense and that's very cool. Uh, it really made me look at alternative explanations. Because, you know, Sean's a reliable observer. He's, a, he's a, an experienced investigator. So I trust him when he says that he saw me. How else do we explain it? Because I'm not, you know, touch wood dead. So we're left with a number of different possible theories as to how he could have seen me. And I don't know what the right answer is. It's one of those strange things in the paranormal that keeps us all coming back for more, isn't it? Yes. Things like that happen. Uh Absolutely, they do. That and physics. <laughs> yes. 
you, you just don't know. Yet, you know, I'm leaning more towards a yeah, it, we're in a multi universe, and at some point they do have they merge a little bit maybe. Uh, and so you can find images of yourself. That's what doppelgangers always were. Uh, I feel very confident in saying that I don't know. <laughs> one of my favorite things. Me too. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll try not to soapbox, but one of my favorite things uh, I've learned from the paranormal is that the more certain somebody is that they know the answer, the less I like them or trust them. <laughs> You'll run into those people. And this is generally true in life. Unless you're dealing with a mathematician, because math is nothing but cold logic, um, a degree of certainty is almost essential to keep you intellectually honest. Yeah. And so I love the people in the paranormal field who say, I'm not sure what's going on. Here's what I think. Here's my very best guess, my very best reasoning. But I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. I love those people. Those people are my people. Um, and in this case, there are so many cool theories as to that would explain yeah. what had been going on, you know, ranging from Sean hallucinated me, although he's not prone <laughs> to hallucinations, right. to, to, you know, alternate universes and everything in between. I just love the fact that I will probably never know how he saw what he saw that night. Right. You know, and also every time I see Sean now, he pokes me to make sure it's actually me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just it. I mean, with science, uh, five years from now, things are going to be all different. Because uh, mm -hmm. every time you learn something, every time something new comes out, you're learning something different. And sometimes it does. Uh, it either reinforces or it changes the way we have to look at the universe. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Linda's talking in the chat room. Linda is uh, one of my colleagues, uh, the, the imaging technician I talked about. Hey, Linda, it's great to great to know you're out there. Um, at Waverly Hills, um, she heard me, she and a fellow uh, investigator, so not just her, heard my voice down in the death tunnel, which if you don't know about Waverly Hills Sanatorium, it's a tunnel that they would use to take the bodies of deceased patients um, down to the hearse. Um, and she heard my voice very clearly coming up from that tunnel, which is fine, but I was on the roof at the opposite end of the building at the time. <laughs> There's no way I could have been down in this, my voice could have filtered down there. No, and yeah. both of them heard it. Well, yeah, and, and and you come right two witnesses, and then you come to the whole question of well, was there some kind of spirit that was imitating me? Because you do get that, especially when you use spirit boxes. Have any of you, if you guys or your listeners that use spirit boxes like the SB seven or eleven, have you heard anything come through that sounded like you or sounded like it was imitating you? I never have. No. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from the chat room if, if folks have had that. Uh, I, some people are saying yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been yeah, wanting I mean, to get one of the yeah. spirit boxes, but I haven't got one yet. Gotcha. I mean, so so it's it's easy to jump to the conclusion that somebody is making fun of you, which is still pretty cool. But then you get to those weird theories that say maybe this is another version of you, somehow communicating from elsewhere, which is even stranger. You know, um, and, and that would horrify my wife because she would tell you one of me is bad enough, hmm. but. <laughs> <laughs> if if we can, you know, we're talking with, with, with multiple instances of ourselves or ourselves from a future point in time. Or, it just boggles the mind. Um, and, and one of the things I've always disliked about conventional science, because I love to read about physics and, and the physical sciences, is the certainty that comes from, from so many scientists that the stuff we are interested in cannot happen and therefore it does not happen. Hmm. You know, if you look at the number of times throughout the history of the physical sciences when scientists have declared that something cannot happen and then it does, a great example is the sound barrier. It was believed right. that it was physically impossible to break the sound barrier. Right. The greatest minds in the world would have told you, you cannot break the sound barrier. It is a hard stop. Well, we did. And I, I also believe we're now told that about the light barrier and the speed of light. I also believe that one day we're going to figure that out too because humans are very resourceful creatures. 